Family Feud. Okay, all those in favor of dismissal, raise your hands. All those opposed, likewise, man, the motion carries. Is it, is it you? Yes, oh, we're going to see him. Oh.
Thank you, Don. Appreciate that. Well, uh, it's been a good year for us. Uh, we paid off our uh, debt. That is a huge, I still, to this day, every time we look at our financial statement, in my head, I think, okay, the first of the next month, we are going to make our payment. Because we always had to do that. The bank said this, but I knew the next week it was going to you know, drop. I still do that. You know? So uh, that was a big deal. Um, you know, I sent a missionary out planning a church, and now finally getting a new roof. So that is, the um, Lord has been really kind to us. And uh, what a great uh, morning we had in celebrating the baptism of Jake and uh, real faithfulness uh, um, and, and a real, real blessing to see what the Lord's been doing uh, there. Um, so that is uh, two people I've got to lay out the gospel three circles with at, at, our, at our state capitol. I just love that. Um, so, uh, well, let's go ahead and grab our Bibles. Uh, turn to Acts chapter 5, Acts 5. Um, speaking of business meeting, um, we're going to look at uh, the worst business meeting ever recorded. And that is saying something. Um, but here is one of those passages that, um, you, you know, I've, I've told you a thousand times now, now that we're in Judges. Uh, it was stories like this that got me into the Bible. Um, but this is certainly one that picks up some of the themes that we saw in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, so it's got a little bit of humor to it, but uh, striking narrative nonetheless. It's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. So if you'll stand with me, we'll read the first 11 verses. Luke writes on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, verse 1, But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself parts of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. And the young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door. They will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet, breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead. They carried her out, buried her beside her husband, and great fear came upon the whole church, upon all who heard of these things. Go, Lord, in prayer. Father, I ask you to be so kind as to give us a right understanding of this passage. This is, this is a difficult passage for, for, for many of us uh, because this, this is a world that we, we just don't understand. Um, but Lord, we believe it is your word. Give us a right interpretation and application of it. So open our entire being so we may become more like Jesus. In the name of your son, we pray. Amen. I remember one day I looked out uh, a window into our backyard and I saw a bunch of birds just hanging out, playing, uh, doing whatever it is that, that birds do. And they seemed to be perfectly content and happy until a single black bird entered into this community. And it wasn't long before, one by one, the variety of beautiful birds started to disappear. It's amazing, isn't it, that a single act and, and in a single moment, what was a perfectly fine, unified situation can all of a sudden scatter and disperse. The church can be like that. Any sort of community of people can be like that. What we have here is an example of what happens when unrepented sin uh, goes unaddressed. What you have is a situation where, where we have in chapter 4, as we'll see, a, a unity and love and charity is at the risk of being destroyed because of two blackbirds. Let's start here in order to understand this passage with the context of what it is that comes before it. Remember that a text without a context is this con contrast, um, uh, but a text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. And so what Luke does is, is that we read this in isolation, but it's actually part of a broader narrative. And what we're supposed to do is contrast what happens at the end of chapter 4 with what happens in the beginning of chapter 5. And, and the final you know, a dozen verses or so 
of chapter 4 emphasizes two priorities of the early church. The first is that of prayer. So if you go down to chapter 4, verse 23, you'll see this. This is where they pray for boldness, right? They, uh, 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 the, the Peter and John have, have been released from, from prison and everything else. And so they gather the church together, and they pray that the Lord would give them boldness. And so you see it there in verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Because they, they weren't going to be stopped because of the, the nation's rage, which is what, what they quote there. Um, and so, um, uh, so verse 31, when they had prayed, the place in which they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So you can see the emphasis of the local church is on prayer. That if the nations, the Gentiles, will rage, we will pray for even more boldness. But then what we get at the end of chapter 4 is an emphasis not just on prayer but on fellowship. Now what you get here in verses 32 to, to 37 uh, reads very similar to what we find at the end of chapter 2. So we don't have time to go into all those details. But just, just notice here, the, the, their fellowship was marked by unity, verse 32. The full number of those who believe were of one heart and soul. Uh, charity, they're in verse 32. No one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in, in common. You, you see uh, their witness, verse 33, and with great power. The apostles were given their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, the grace of God. Um, and the great grace was upon them all. So you can see here the fellowship was rooted in the gospel and the unity of the gospel that sent them out into the world. Now, to illustrate the, these points, particularly this latter emphasis, we are introduced to a character that we're probably familiar with, and his name is um, uh, Barnabas. And we meet him uh, um, starting in, um, well, it was starting in verse 36, but, but, but just to give some details, verse 34, uh, there was not a needy person among them for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed each as, as he had need. So that what you have here is benevolence, basically, is that people were so radical in their charity that they sold their property and used that money, you know, to fix the church roof. And, and so, so, so the, the apostles' feet was the benevolence committee, if that helps. Um, and so uh, the, the whole point is to say, Christ has given us his life, what is my house? I mean, this is a radical understanding of the gospel. It's a beautiful picture of the gospel. And you need to notice here, this is not a requirement of the gospel. Rather, having moved by the Spirit, they felt compelled to be overly generous. And, and it is shocking to read this. You see something similar at the end of chapter 2, as we said. Uh, because what's, what's amazing is that, that this sort of generosity isn't tied to law. 10%, not a penny more, not a penny less. But rather, it's rooted in grace. Christ shed every drop of his blood. So what is a house? What is property? What is X, Y, and Z? So they give it in great generosity. To illustrate that, uh, all of this, we meet Joseph Barnabas in verses 36 and 37. Now notice we, we don't know much about him, verse 36. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money laid at the apostles' feet. Notice here that we get people were doing this, but most specifically, Joseph Barnabas was doing, or just Joseph in general. So, so, so you see what Luke is doing here. He's saying that this was fairly common. Not everybody did this, but some of those who had land and had property, they sowed that and then laid at the apostles' feet. Let me give you one example because we are introduced to a character that will show up later in the narrative. Barnabas will join Paul in the first missionary journey. So this is his introduction here. But notice that we don't have a lot of information about him, at least initially. His name is Joseph, a very common Jewish name, particularly in Israel, but he is from Cyprus. Uh, he is given a nickname. Uh, men are quite fond of nicknames. Um, his nickname, Barnabas, Bar, meaning son. So Barnabas means son of encouragement, uh, which means this is the guy that everybody likes because he never has anything bad to say about them, right? You need people like this in your life. Um, and, and, and it wouldn't hurt if you were that person in other people's life, to be a person of uh, encouragement. Can, can I just add a little footnote here? Actually, Dr. York mentioned this in class when I was in a uh, cemetery, that uh, when it comes to leadership, here's a good uh, rule of thumb. I think it's brilliant. I, I try to do it in various ways. Um, in leadership, 10 out of boys for every one, what were you thinking? 
That is to say, that if you want to get the best out of someone, there are times to correct, but let it be preceded by repetition of encouragement. Right? You could do this in coaching and do it with, with the boys. You could do it in, of course, in pastoral ministry. You could do it with your kids. You know, that a boy, that a boy, that a boy, that a boy. We, we got to work on this, you know. Um, and so I, I think that that attitude of encouragement is a biblical thing. Anyways, um, but we see that his tribe is that he is a Levite. And yet here he is, having embraced Christ, has done so rather radically. He has given up everything that the young rich ruler wouldn't give up. And now he is wanting to follow Christ. So what we have here is, is quite an example uh, for us. And, and it's interesting that Luke doesn't dedicate a lot of examples to, to, or a lot of space to Barnabas' example. He just highlights. He said, look, let me give you the name of one person who did this. That way, if you want to check the deed books of what's sowed, look up Joseph, known as Barnabas. And the contrast then is what it is we get in chapter 5. And this leads to our passage, the, the chronicle of what happened. So, so with Barnabas in mind, we can now meet Ananias and Sapphira. And in fact, we see this connection to the end of chapter 4 right there in the first, verse, or first word of chapter 5. The word is but. Barnabas did all these things. And everything was great. It was wonderful. But. Is that how you tell stories? Right, you, you, you give, you know, you, if you've got to give constructive criticism, you start with all the good stuff. Uh, when I took preaching class, this was the model. Uh, the professor, you know, we, we judged each other, you know, because that's biblical. And so, so we, 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 we go, you know, you, you preach, and then the, the professor says, I had a great preaching professor. Um, you may think he didn't do any good, but, but I had a, a really good preaching professor. And, and he would say, okay, tell me everything you, you liked about the sermon, right? And you would go and go and go. And he would point out, hey, I really liked that you did this and that and all this sort of stuff. And then it would be, well, let's share something that, that uh, Brother So-and-So can work on, right? That's the big but, right? Uh, that, that, that's the one where it's like, yeah, everything's great. But not everything is wonderful. This is the, the contrast to Barnabas. So what we do is, in verses 1 and 2, we meet a married couple who are members of this church, they use that language, who scheme. These are schemers, to use the language of the joker. These are schemers. In fact, verse 2, there's a strong verb there. It's, uh, uh, the word means to, to keep back. It's only used three times in the New Testament twice here in Acts 5. It's a rare word, and it's a strong word to use here. It means to hold back. Another word we could use is embezzle. They are embezzling here. It describes using the funds of another. Now think about what, what the way this system is, is that you, you sell your property of your own free will. Peter's going to pick this up. And then you give it to the church. You give it to the Lord. So what they are doing is they are claiming we, we, we sold our property for X amount of dollars. So don't judge our property's value by Zillow, okay? That's not true. We sold it, and we didn't sell it for as much as we wanted, but we wanted to give it to the Lord. And they say we want to give all of it to the Lord. And thus, in that context, all of it is the Lord's. So when they hold back portions of it, they are actually embezzling from God himself. Does that make sense? That, 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 that's, that's the idea, is that you come saying this is all of it when actually you're stealing from God himself. Now, now, this is not a new message in the Bible. It's not the first time we see something like this. The most prominent example comes at the end of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 3, uh, I bet at some point you've had verse 10 quoted or maybe even memorized. Will man rob God? Malachi is a series of questions. Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You have cursed with the curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Verse 10 is probably the one that you're familiar with. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse. There may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing till there is no more need. You see, the, the point here is, is he's, he's saying that, that what is mine you have taken for yourself. And in that context, what you have is a type of embezzlement. Now, that's not going to fly in the court of law, grant it. However, I think we can see what, is, what, what the real problem here is. And so we meet this couple, and they are going to embezzle. They are going to keep back 
hold back the resources they say are the Lord's. And so what we have then is the judgment that falls upon Ananias and Sapphira. What's interesting here is that equal space is given to both uh, both the husband and the wife. Verses 3 to 6 is Ananias. Verses 7 to 10 is Sapphira. And, and, um, and both follow the same pattern. It begins with confrontation. Is this everything? It follows by deception. Oh, yeah, this is everything. Followed by judgment, right? You're going to die. And then finally, cleansing that the young men, here's a job for the trustees, the young men come in and they have to wrap up the, the, the dead body right here. And, and, you know, this probably happens during an invitation, no doubt. And then they have to go bury. This is the first church cemetery. That thought just hit me, right? The, this is where it started. You know, the first church cemetery, Ananias, Sapphira, don't do what they did, you know. Um, in fact, God put it in a book so we wouldn't forget. And so what we get then is after their, their, their judgment is, is uh, quite the understanding. Verse 5, when Ananias heard these words, he fell down, breathed his last, and great phobos, fear. That's where we get the word phobia. Great fear came upon all who heard it. How would you like to have a business meeting like this? Right? We're, oh, before, before we get the financial report, you know, Ananias says, you know, my wife is still getting ready for church. I'll make that joke here in a minute. Uh, but my wife's still getting ready for church. I want to go ahead and bring some of our proceeds. Oh, brother, that is so great. Barnabas is over and say, you go, Annie. You go. That's right. That's my boy. And so he comes down and Peter's like, is this it? How would you like a preacher to say that? Is this it? Thou art dead. Boom. All those in favor of being a trustee, the nominated committee needs to pick people in order to bury Ananias. And they go off to bury him. And then finally, Sapphira has, has finished getting ready. I mean, how long does it take to get ready for church, ladies? And so she, she, she comes in, and it's still a business meeting. She comes in, and same thing. And Peter says, is this it? Is this all of it? It sure is. And she falls down and dies. And these guys covered in dirt finally walk in. Can you imagine they're going to sit in the pew full of dirt? How shameful. And, and Peter says, don't worry about sitting down. I've got another job for you. Right next to Ananias, I need you to bury her. No wonder then we read in not just in verse 5, great fear came upon them, but verse 11, the same thing. Great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. I think that's fair to say that is quite the, the understatement. I bet Peter's glad social media didn't exist at this time, right? You know one of the teenagers got this on video, you know, and is immediately on, on TikTok. Now, that's weird to us because we can't imagine making fear a priority of the local church. But if you read Acts, it's all over the place. Can I give you three examples just for the sake of time? Acts chapter 2, this is the day of Pentecost. Uh, all... Uh, came upon every so, and many wonders and signs were being done through them. The word all there is the same word used here. Fear came upon them. Acts chapter 9. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was built up and walking in the fear. It's phobia. It's phobia. Phobos. Finally, Acts chapter 19. Uh, by the way, notice the connection to Holy Spirit and fear here. Acts 19, and this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jew and Greeks, and fear fell upon them. The name of the Lord Jesus Christ was extolled. It's the same word, and we have it here. We can understand why fear would come here, but, but, and, and the fear is very real. That, that, that if my faith is but showy, if my exercise of my faith is but a mask to be worn for the validation of others. I stand in judgment before God. That's not much different than what Jesus warned in the Sermon on the Mount. Many of you will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did, did, did we not sell our property and give all the money to you in your name? Uh, Dr. York's sermon on this is excellent at, at, at Southern when I was a student there. It was called A Discount Devotion. I love that title, A Discount Devotion, because it really gets to what is perhaps the, the heart here. But this is an interesting strategy for church, church growth, isn't it? I mean, can you imagine putting the ad out? Don't go to that Baptist church. You might die. And yet, guess what happens? People flock in. Not because they're here to see a show. 
Not because they want to be entertained, but because they can see with their own eyes the living God is present with these people. And that is something exciting. That is something to fear. That's why that word all sort of gets sort of at both ideas. That the Lord is there. So holiness then in the early church was of greater importance for them than numerical growth. That is something we American evangelicals have got to accept. Um, when we did this years ago, I, I wrote uh, my academic paper on the revival here in Kentucky. What struck me is they never sought revival. What they sought was a pure church. And when revival hit, the church was ready. I think we've sort of gone about it the opposite way. We think when revival comes, then we'll be a pure church. I think they had it right in 1800. We must prioritize purity and holiness. Well, then let's look at the chart. So what, what do we do with this? What, what are some things we can pull from this? Um, let's just emphasize, I think I got four here. Maybe I have 15, I don't know. Number one, um, the, we need to look at the role of the Holy Spirit in the local church. Well, we talked about the role that fear played in the book of Acts, and that's certainly a study in of itself. But we could certainly do a full study of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he is all over the place. Let me give you just a few examples. Yeah, we, we could do more of this. In Acts chapter 1 and 2, the Holy Spirit comes down to establish the church. You shall have Christ going up. Uh, the Spirit will come upon you, Acts 1a, and you will be my witnesses among the world. And then Acts 2, the Spirit comes down, and you get the first evangelical sermon preached by Peter, and souls are saved. You have the establishing of the church in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 4, the apostles are emboldened when they are filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is where, where, where as we saw, that they, having been filled, they get imprisoned. And the Lord uses them through that. In Acts chapter 6, we get the first deacons, and they are to be men who are full of the Spirit. Acts chapter 7, one of those deacons, a man by the name of Stephen, was so filled with the Holy Spirit, he's killed. <laughs> uh, let that sink in next time you watch a Pentecostal preacher on the telly. Acts chapter 8, the Spirit descends on the Samaritans. You know, those people. In fact, later, it is the apostles say, something strange happened. The same experience we had in receiving the Spirit, these, these other people, these other people, these outcasts we don't like, they experienced it too. What do you think God's trying to tell us? Acts chapter 10, the Holy Spirit comes to the Gentiles through Cornelius. You remember the story Peter getting the dream? And, and, and Jesus has to say, Peter, I don't care about bacon. <laughs> it's like, you can't go to Cornelius' house and get an upset about pork, okay? <laughs> we got to deal with this. But it's, that's really the beginning of the mission to the Gentiles. Acts 13, the, the Holy Spirit ordains Paul and Barnabas. We meet Barnabas here. Ordains them to, to go out on their first mission journey in the church of Antioch. And finally, Acts chapter 16 is the Holy Spirit that leads Paul to Macedonia re, rather than where he was going. You remember, Paul wants to go here, and the Holy Spirit says, no, you're going to go there, so Paul goes there. And, and, and what does the Holy Spirit say? Look, I got people over here. And, and, and I'm going to lead them to you. You're going to plant a church there in Macedonia. The Holy Spirit's all over the place. So it's not an accident then that the Holy Spirit plays a prominent role in this scene. See, Ananias and Sapphira did not just sin against the church. They didn't just sin, you know, in, in their hearts against each other. They didn't just sin against the needy or against fellow believers. They ultimately sinned against God. And we can prove this point rather uh, simple, can't we? Uh, in fact, if you ever study theology and you study the person of the Holy Spirit, this is one of those passages that you're, you're likely going to look at. Uh, notice verse 3. Look at the language that, that is used here. Verse 3. Uh, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit to keep back some of the pros to embezzle? So notice, who is he sinning against? The Holy Spirit. Okay, well, go over to, uh, to, to the rest. Uh, the, uh, we'll just go down to verse 4. While it remained on so, did it not remain your own? He, he said, like, you didn't have to give all the money out. You didn't have to say you're going to do this. Say, hey, look, we sold this property. We're going to keep some of it to downsize. So, so we still need a house to live, and we want to use that for others, yes. Uh, we still got to raise our kids. But we want to take the profit from that and give it to the church. That would have been fine. But what you said is all of it is going to the church. Why? Because you want to be compared to people like Joseph Barnabas. So, so well, you didn't have to do all that. And then notice this, after it was so, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have con uh, contrived this deed in your heart? 
You have not lied to man, but to who? God. Now, which is it? Verse 3, the Holy Spirit, or verse 4, God? The answer is, of course, yes. Notice that, that, that Peter can mix the terms, not by diluting the meaning of either word, but because they are synonyms in this context. The Holy Spirit is God. He's the third person of God. He isn't an it, therefore a force like in, in Star Wars, therefore this impersonal force that you can just sort of conjure up if you, if you get the feels, but rather is the third person of the Trinity. He is a he, and he has been lied to. He, that is God, in the person of the Holy Spirit. David understood this, didn't he? You remember when, when David sinned against Bathsheba and Uriah and all them? You remember what Nathan says after he gives his little parable about the, 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 the two neighbors and the sheep? He says, uh, you know, he confronts them. And then, and then David writes in his repentance psalm, I sinned against you, God. Of course, you know, Bathsheba's like, well, what about me? You know, what about my, my husband, my late husband? Uh, David rightly understood that sin at its core is rebellion, rebellion against God that often uh, causes victims of our neighbors. So, so that's what you have here, is that by sinning against the Holy Spirit, they are sinning and therefore damaging the church. This is a very serious problem here. See, whenever we, we, make, it, we make it about... Um, uh, basic accounting. We act like uh, Peter overreacted, but when you realize that sin is an affront to God, all of a sudden you realize that, that judgment must be rendered. Judgment has to be rendered. Well, secondly, what we see here is the danger of sin among the, God's people. Again, we, we undermine this when we read it. If we read this passage as an overreaction from God, we do so by diluting the reality of sin. And what you have here is a passage that's going after not the sinners on the outside, the sinners on the inside. One of the things about uh, when, when Christianity is the dominant culture is we often expect non-believers to look like Christians while tolerating ungodly behavior among our own. Does that make sense? We, 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 we throw a fit like, why are my godless neighbors acting so godless? And then in the church, we'll say, well, he's just a good old boy. We will often throw a fit about the wickedness of the wicked, but we will justify the unrighteousness of those who claim to be righteous. No doubt, the most frustrating part of ministry is to pour your heart and soul and attention and everything out and watch so many choose sin over their Savior. Without a doubt, it's the biggest frustration. And it is an unfortunate reality in our fallen world. We are all susceptible to this temptation. In fact, there was a, a helpful article of someone I, I actually graduated with. Uh, they've written several books. Brilliant, brilliant guy. Um, he actually endorsed my first book. Very kind of him. But he um, wrote an article about what do we do with our spiritual heroes who had some closet or skeletons in their closets. And the one, he, one example he gave, he, he looked at Lewis, and he, he looked at Ravi Zacharias, but what he looked at was Karl Barth, easily the greatest theologian in the 20th century. Um, and Barth was married, who fell in love, if I can use that language, with another woman. And knowing it was wrong, he justified it theologically to the point that he had his girlfriend, his mistress, move in with him and his wife. And you can read Karl Barth's Systematic Theology. I mean, it's a big, thick thing. I mean, it, it is, it's a bear to get through. Um, I think I have one volume. Maybe I may still have it. Um, and he justifies it. He justifies it. Using the same language you would get in a Disney story. Sometimes the heart wants what the heart wants. It's amazing how easy that, that, that we can do this. Our ability to cover up our sin is legendary. The, this couple premeditated their embezzlement, and what's impressive is they stuck to the story. I mean, they clearly just premeditated. No matter what they ask, this is the story you give. We sold the property, and this is what it is, so we're bringing it to you. How many of us are just as guilty at covering up our sin we spend more time doing that than pursuing the Savior. Clearly, what this text shows is God takes 
holiness among his people seriously. We've said this before, that the greatest threat to the early church was not persecution. It was not violence. It was compromise. Well, we've got to move on. I'm already late. So thirdly, uh, the importance of pure motives. We spent quite a bit of time talking about this with the Sermon on the Mount, um, that um, one of the ironies of the story is that Ananias' name means God is gracious. So it's just a shame that Ananias wasn't. Um, well, um, we can debate what their motivation was, maybe seeking validation, maybe it's an issue of comparison. Um, comparison is a major problem in America. I mean, social media, making tons of money, gathering our information off of that. Um, I, I've told this story before that years ago, um, uh, one of our neighbors, because we were out in the country, so our, our, our neighbors, you could walk to their house, but, um, but you know, they were, they were over yonder. And, and uh, this is an old high school buddy of dad and whatnot. I, I think he brought home a, uh, like a classic car. I don't remember what it was. And that night, we caught dad searching similar cars that he could buy. You know? And, and we, we teased him. We, we, we knew what he was doing. And we know what he was doing because I do that. I do that. I have a rather large theological library. I, I don't know how it happened, but here it is. I'm a big reader. I can go to a pastor's library and be jealous of the books that I don't have. <laughs> and I have get everything I want. We are always comparing ourselves. Other pastors are just world's terrible about this. Uh, if only I could preach like that. If only I could write a bestseller like that. If only I could, uh, uh, you know, have a growing church like that. On and on and on it goes. Well, move on. Finally, the necessity of holy, holy leadership within the home. I think this is a, uh, not the main point of this text, but I do think it's worth mentioning it in the text. That what you have here is an Adam and Eve situation where um, much as Adam failed to lead in the home well, I think Ananias bears some special, uh, not blame, but accountability. Um, at some point, he should have said, whether it was his idea or his wife's, or they came to it at the same time, he should have said, this is not what the Lord wants from us. Godly leadership in the home matters. And when it is not the priority, particularly of the men in the home, you, you, you get devastating results. Devastating results. But nevertheless, despite this, the good news of the text is that the church wasn't stunted by sin. But because Christ is risen, the church overcame it. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? At the end of the day, Christianity is a religion of hope. Because if death can be conquered, so can anything else. It may take time, and we may not be able to see it in our lifetime, or maybe see how it is possible. But time and time again, God has proven to be faithful, and, and God's kingdom will continue to grow. And lives will continue to be changed. What we want to be is to be like a Barnabas, a son of encouragement who keep our eyes on Jesus and the work of the kingdom rather than an Ananias who can only see what is in front of him, motivated perhaps by bitterness or jealousy or, or greed or whatever else. Let us be motivated by the glory of God through the people of God. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll, we'll be dismissed. Father, I ask you to be so kind as to... Um, Help us to grasp the beauty of this text. Uh, it's, it's, it's a weird one for, for us because uh, it forces us to, to confront some things. But it does show us that what the church should be, but also, unfortunately, what the church often is. There are many people, some driving by us right now, that if we look at the front door, we can see them, who are driving around, whether they admit it or not, with church hurt. Whatever the story is, whatever the context is, and that is an unfortunate reality as we continue to see the decline of Christianity in the West. But at times, we do have to look in the mirror. We can blame the academy, we can blame the politicians, we can blame the culture, but we should also be able to look ourselves in the mirror and realize uh, that, that we, have, we have pushed a lot of people away through hypocrisy and sin. Lord, I ask that revival that we seek culturally begins within the church. Let it begin here at East Frankfurt Baptist Church. Why not here? Why not us? Why not now? Lord, you, you have to do this. We recognize that we are too weak, but you are our strength, and Christ is sufficient. Help us to be more like Jesus. Help us to be 
the sort of people who would bring glory to your name in this dark, godless world that we live in. And let your spirit move in our time as it did in the days of the apostles. Let fear and awe be ever present as we see the world change for your kingdom and glory. In the name of your son we pray. Amen.